Uh, let's see if I'm over here. Okay, we're going to get started. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Aleka Skoko, who is visiting us from Einstein Montefiore, where she is chief resident in neurosurgery. Her training is Cornell, followed by Case Western, uh, followed by Einstein, with a year at Penn, and she has particular interest in all things neurosurgical. General Neurosurgery uh, has published widely on a number of topics, particularly in spine. In the past year, has been spent doing critical care at 10. So that's been an interest in a lot of publications as well, along with things like ethics and global health. I noticed that her collegiate background included degrees in science and arts. I think it's pretty cool and a good thing to do. She's going to be talking to us about critical care, specifically intracranial monitoring, and be with us the next two days. And I think a lot of us get a chance to meet with you. So it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dempsey. And it's an honor to be here talking to all of you. It's nice to also be in person. We transitioned ourselves just recently to hybrid grand round. So um, I think it brings a little bit of an extra personal feel and it's easier to pay attention. All right, so I'm going to be talking about intracranial monitoring, um, which is a large topic, obviously, and could fill multiple lectures. So I may skim over some things and hopefully we'll get to the end, but please cut me off if you did. So just an outline, I'm going to talk a little bit about TBI frame kind of the um, setup and indications that we will be talking about. There are other indications, of course, for intracranial monitoring besides TBI, but that will be the main um, target for this talk. And then the different intracranial monitoring modalities. And then hopefully we'll have time to get to some of the evidence for monitoring based treatment. So, TBI. Um, this is a CDC image, and it just kind of shows you the pyramid of what we see as providers. Um, you know, we see about 300 hospitalizations, people who come in with TBI, and of those, 50% will lead to persistent deficits. The ED sees more. They won't call us for all of these people. Um, and then interestingly, you know, there's this whole host of people that probably have some kind of concussion playing American football or soccer and, um, you know, don't really get care, but they have some memory issues for a month after. And those people still count as TBI patients. And there's actually a lot of research right now into biomarkers to help those T people because there is morbidity from that disease, even if we don't see them here in the hospital. And interestingly, I just wanted to show that, you know, TBI over the past couple decades has changed. Um, motor vehicle incidents have decreased, or rather the TBI from them has, partly because of public health measures. When I was born, I remember that seatbelts were not, again, or it was not mandatory to wear seatbelts in the car. Wear and so, you know, that's actually had an impact, which is a good thing. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing a shift in intentional self-harm, whether that's the prevalence in numbers or rather more violent forms of injury. I'm not sure, uh, but that's a big part of this population. And so, of course, given the societal impact of TBI, there have been a lot of clinical trials. Um, on the right are just some of the um, agents that have been used for kind of medical therapy for TBIs. And unfortunately, as you can see in this bottom left chart, um, sure, I'm one of the most experts. of them don't have a significant impact statistically in helping these patients. So we're very young in the research. Um, and unfortunately, you know, patients come in, we can stabilize them, monitor them. There's not that much we can do, especially from a medical standpoint. Um, and I won't go too much into this. There was some hope from clinical phase two trials for progesterone in TBI patients, but phase three trials showed no benefit. And so um, a bunch of editorials have come out in the literature uh, to try and kind of reassess how we're thinking about TBI and the three different kind of points in which we can classify these patients and target them for treatment. Um, and so, you know, 
from the presenting pathophysiology. There's a lot of research both in the basic science as well as kind of mechanisms of injury. Um, the treatments is what a lot of us clinically are doing, especially from an ICU standpoint. And then outcomes are an important measure, of course, to look at. And so these are just a couple of the TBI groups that across the world are looking at this, working together. It's very impressive. Um, and then some of the new biomarker studies just on the right to show that you know, it's all stages of treatment that we're looking at. <clears throat> all right, so going to intracranial monitoring. So first I wanna talk about the goals of our monitoring. Why are we actually doing this? Because, you know, intracranial monitoring, whether it's an ICP monitor um, or like a quad lumen pull with an ICP monitor and other modalities, it can be a morbid procedure. You're going into the parenchyma most of the time. Um, and we want to have a good purpose to what we're doing. So, um, a big part of this is preventing secondary injury. So, primary injury, you know, happens at impact of TBI, and it can be the car crash, you have a contusion, and then not only can you have blossoming of contusion, but there's a lot of microvascular and cell level damage that happens that we want to one prevent. And if we're unable to prevent, target. And that often, as seen in the graph below, um, you know, happens not right at the time of injury, but over the couple weeks that they might be in the ICU. So there's many causes of secondary injury. Some of them are preventable, such as hypotension, hypoxia, ischemia, seizures, and then there's excitotoxicity, inflammation, um, glycemic uh, supply to the brain, mitochondrial dysfunction, something very hard to target and treat, um, and hypercoagulability and free radical injury. And so just Highlighting again, this is our goal. So how do we limit um, secondary injury? One of the goals of resuscitation for the brain, especially, is to maintain tissue metabolism, but that goes for the whole body, of course. We have to make sure there's sufficient perfusion, which is fuel, um, and that doesn't just include blood flow with oxygen, but some of the other metabolites um, to meet the metabolic demands. <laughs> And so, you know, in general critical care, some of the surrogates for resuscitation are urine output, lactic acid, and MAP. In neurocritical care, MAP is very important, as well as our neuro exam. However, you know, once we detect a neuro change, oftentimes that secondary injury has already occurred and is ongoing. So just to talk about the different modalities. Um, so the main three I'm going to talk about are ICP monitoring, brain oxygen monitoring, and cerebral microdialysis, of which we used all at Penn. Um, we don't use it at my medical center now, Monitor Einstein. We do just ICP monitoring, have the capacity for brain oxygen monitoring. Um, but I really think that cerebral microdialysis, even though it's not evidence-based yet, can provide us with some interesting information. And um, I think there's some future to this field. <coughs> All right, so ICP monitors. I would be remiss, of course, in a neurocritical care talk if I didn't talk about cerebral perfusion pressure, uh, which we all know is MAP minus ICP. Um, and, you know, elevated ICP leads to secondary injury, whether it's from compression causing strokes itself or, you know, damage to cells. It changes cerebral blood flow, which is the main mechanism for this injury. And then I will also just add, you know, cerebral perfusion pressure we can measure with an ICP monitor. Um, however, it's a surrogate for cerebral blood flow. Uh, you know, we can't really measure easily the cerebral vascular resistance. It's different in different people. It depends on your age. Um, and so we use CPP as a surrogate. There are a couple ways to actually measure CVF, um, but they have some issues and we'll talk about that. Um, the, you know, final kind of essential doctrine that I have to also mention, of course, is Monroe Kelly. We're all familiar with the skull as a constant space, and you can only um, change some of the fluids, I guess, that are in that space to compensate for a mass lesion, extra blood, or what have you. The brain tissue is, you know, something that we really can't change except for altering the water content. And on the volume pressure curve, of course, you know, the slope becomes very high as volume approaches the maximum that the skull can contain, um, and ICP will shoot up at that point. 
And so we all know clinical signs of elevated ICP. The only reason I mentioned this is, you know, when you have a patient that comes in with these things and you're like, oh, this is a GCS less than eight, we've got to put in a monitor. Uh, just make sure, you know, you can treat them at least medically before then. You're going to do probably either EBD and or an ICP monitor, but give your 23% or mannitol or 5%, 150 cc's. I don't know what you use here, um, but it's just important to kind of contextualize everything and not think too academic. So different kinds of intracranial monitors. We have global monitors, which such as ICP, um, cerebral perfusion pressure, um, the pulse tile reactivity index, which we'll talk about in a minute, and the um, saturation of the venous oxygen of the jugular bulb. And then we have focal monitors for cerebral blood flow, the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissue, microdialysis, as well as brain temperature. And so I'll just briefly mention um, jugular bulb oximetry. I had a chance, I believe this was used a lot more a few decades ago. I had a chance to place one of these monitors and then, but basically, you know, when we get a mixed venous sat from a central line, you're getting inflow and tissue uh, demand of oxygen from not only the brain, but the arms into the brachiocephalic. And so that doesn't actually represent the metabolic activity of the brain. And there have been studies that show in TBI patients, some people are hypermetabolic and have an elevated CMRO2 uh, metabolic demand, and some are hypometabolic. And it's hard to treat those patients if you don't know what they're actually getting um, in terms of oxygen delivery. So the jugular bulb catheter, which is kind of inserted the opposite way of the central um, line, you know, you go up and you're going to end up by the C1 arch is the goal, but you have to use x-ray to localize it. Of course, if you are too short, you can't go further because you're not sterile. So it's a little bit complicated and finicky, but can be helpful. And there's issues, of course, besides with placement, drift, calibration, and zeroing, which is, of course, issues with a lot of these monitors. And then just briefly to talk about cerebral blood perfusion monitoring. Um, this is something I haven't used personally, but, you know, it goes in and will provide actual real-time information about the blood perfusion at the site of placement. Um, and unfortunately, though, there's a lot of artifact and I haven't seen it used. I'm not sure if you guys do. Uses thermal diffusion, though, for detection. All right, so our basic ICP monitors, I'm sure you guys are familiar with. They usually stay in about a week, um, can work pretty well for that time for most patients, I'd say. Um, and of course, we treat ICPs based on the uh, 2016 Brain Tra Trauma Foundation guidelines if they're over 22. Many of them also measure brain temperature, although the utility is arguable, um, and we can use the waveform as well. And so, sorry. This is our quad lumen bolt, which is kind of the most modalities you can put in an ICP monitor. Um, and the interesting thing, of course, is discussing where to put your bolt, because you're going to get different focal results from the brain tissue at the place of your monitor, and it may not reflect all of the brain. And so you have to be judicious in um, placing this, usually for TBI. You're going to try and target some place that is you know, not near the exact site of injury. However, there's an argument to be made to put it in the penumbra because that's tissue at risk. However, again, that may have cells that are not fully functioning and giving you false values. And so I'm not gonna go through treatment of elevated ICP. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but you know, we can optimize kind of ICP via three different main ways. One is targeting blood flow and minimizing venous return. Um, the other is, you know, in brain tissue, we can take out brain water, or you can surgically take out actual brain tissue or mass lesion, whatever is causing um, the elevation and the intracranial pressure. And then um, CSF drainage is another way, of course, to decrease the intracranial pressure. Uh, EVDs can help for this, but unfortunately, we don't have a good, you know, medical treatment, of course, that we can use acutely. And then I um, just included, you know, this is from the Seattle International Severe TBI Consensus, which the Brain Trauma Foundation also references. And so you know, we have different tiers of ICP treatment. And just I'm mentioning all of this because there is evidence-based medicine to treat ICP. So that's why we put in monitors for GCS less than eight. It can help us in care and increase perfusion. 
hopefully prevent secondary injury. These are the other tiers. Um, okay. So, you know, in TBI, not only do we have hypermetabolic and hypometabolic people, but people who also have loss of autoregulation. And this is something that's difficult to directly assess. So the pressure reactivity index is using ICP monitoring as well as MAP. You can kind of do a classic critical care challenge test in which you observe the ICP response to an increased MAP or a pressure challenge. And it has been validated um, to show, you know, prognosis in which patients who have a narrow or an increased pressure activity index, but meaning a narrow range of autoregulation have higher mortality. And so this is just showing, you know, in this patient on the right, as we're increasing the, oh, sorry. As we're increasing the map, um, the ICP and cerebral blood flow, so the ICP will go down to maintain cerebral blood flow, but that only maintains in the very normal window instead of the larger window in which, you know, people like us can accommodate. And so then your CBF will, um, ICP shoots up and you'll get hyperemia, but not be able to adequately supply oxygen without secondary injury. And just this has also been validated, as I said. Um, this is one of the studies from neurotrauma in which uh, there was 11.5% prediction and mortality benefit from using the tulsatile uh, reactivity index. further on this. So, all right, brain oxygen monitoring. So, you know, cerebral blood flow happens from penetrating vessels, virtual robin spaces. Um, we know the amount of blood flow that's normal to normal brain tissue. Um, and there are many factors affecting cerebral blood flow. Right now, we're going to talk about the oxygen concentration. Um, also, there are some other factors, of course, that control more on a micro level. Um, anything from sympathetic stimulation itself to um, age-related constriction of arterioles, decreasing compliance that just should be in the back of our mind but aren't our main focus right now. And so the normal tissue partial pressure of oxygen is 35 to 40. Um, you know, in the brain, when it decreases around 30, you get vasodilation, an increase in CBF, trying to augment that oxygen delivery to the tissues because the partial pressure is less. Uh, and then when it drops below 20, you get a coma. And, you know, because the brain is insulin independent, glucose trans, um, transport, then that's why people who get insulin overdoses actually go into coma and they receive less oxygen. Um, and then the Bohr effects will come back to you in a minute. And so, you know, for actual brain oxygen monitoring, you have an electrode that detects and is reduced by oxygen diffusing towards the electrode. Um, and then that electric current carries it up and quantifies for us the brain tissue oxygen level. And so the ability to measure brain tissue oxygen has been around for a while. The FDA approved um, the first device in about 18 years ago. And we have different ones, Remedic, Integra Lycox. Um, however, there's no data that it actually improves outcome. So we're getting a lot of information, which, you know, everyone thinks information is good. We love information as medical professionals. Um, however, how do we use that and does it actually help? I'll get to that actually a little bit later. All right. And so the probe usually can also stay in for about a week. Um, this can act again as a surrogate of cerebral blood flow, uh, and it will diffuse around a 15 millimeter radius. So you're not just getting that focal point over. It's definitely not representative of the whole brain tissue. And then there's kind of, you know, if you have low PBTO2 and based on some theoretical evidence or in progress evidence, um, augmenting it should help prevent secondary injury. So how do we do that? So there's kind of three ways um, improving the actual delivery whether that's in augmenting sort of blood flow through increasing MAP, reducing ICP, um, or improving oxygen carrying capacity. So that goes back to the Bohr equation, right? And if we, you know, uh, hyperventilate them, try and decrease the acid in the blood or CO2, um, we can try and shift that curve so that hemoglobin doesn't want to bind to oxygen as well, and it's going to release it to the brain. 
Um, and then we can try and improve oxygen diffusion. That's actually fairly easy from, you know, a ventilated patient just by increasing the FiO2 on the vent or giving an awake patient nasal cannula, high flow, um, and trying to reduce edema through um, either hyperosmolar therapy or other methods. And then reducing oxygen demand usually comes a little bit later in our thinking, unless the patient is already comatose. Um, but you can use the anesthesia, hypothermia, as well as, of course, controlling shivering, seizures, and agitation. And you'll notice that a lot of these things are parallel with treatment for elevated ICP. Um, so, you know, it's not anything that we do necessarily differently, except probably augmentation of the FiO2. Uh, but it's an interesting thing to kind of shift the framework of our thinking. All right, and so cerebral microdialysis, getting even more nitty gritty. All right, so again, we're talking about metabolic activity. We're now trying to meet what the supply needs are of the brain um, instead of kind of focusing on demand itself. And so lack of oxygen delivery for five to 10 seconds in the brain, which is the shortest of any tissue, will shut down metabolism. Um, and that can lead to cell death fairly quickly. So we kind of want to look at, you know, anaerobic metabolism. What's going on? Can we detect that early and maybe prevent it? All right, so back to biochemistry. When we're talking about aerobic and anaerobic metabolism, normally in the brain, you're going to have glucose transport. And then glucose through glycolysis will generate a couple ATP. Um, and then you get pyruvate, which can then be transported into the Krebs or citric acid cycle, where you get your majority of ATP generation. Um, and there's also glutamate involved. These are the four kind of metabolic markers we use in cerebral microdialysis. Um, and it's really important because if we don't have enough oxygen, then you'll shift to anaerobic metabolism, which doesn't generate enough energy for the hungry brain, um, and it will lead eventually to cell death. So how do we use these markers? Um, and just sorry, as I mentioned, uh, you get 36 to 38 ATP if you go way back to medical school from one glucose molecule normally, but two in anaerobic. So. Let's see how we can deal with this. All right, so cerebral microdialysis is usually about 70% reflective of the extracellular space, but again, around that focal tissue near your catheter. Um, and so the highest utility is in detecting ischemia and anaerobic metabolism, and that's you know either just ischemia as well as mitochondrial dysfunction, which is a little bit different, and I'll get to. But you get an elevation in your lactate pyruvate ratio, suggesting that we're shifting only to anaerobic metabolism. You'll get an elevated glutamate and as well as glycerol lag. So these are kind of thresholds below, um, which aren't necessarily intuitive, but you can always look them up, of course. And we'll go into each one. All right. So hypoglycemia is bad for patients in general. It's really bad for the brain. And that's how this all starts in the shift towards anaerobic metabolism. Um, and so, you know, there are treatments for low glucose. So if you detect this in the brain and let's say the blood sugar is 120, but you know, the brain glucose is like one, um, you're going to be able to treat this. Hopefully not necessarily will glucose always be uptake. And, um, but that's why we have some of these other markers. All right, and then lactate. So lactate in anywhere in the body is one of the earliest markers of ischemia. Um, and the lactate pyruvate ratio has been shown to be fairly reliable um, for energy crisis, showing that. And there are different states in which it will be elevated. The two main ones, as I said, are <coughs> ischemia and mitochondrial dysfunction. And then glutamate. We've all heard of glutamate excitotoxicity. Um, you know, when we're in anaerobic metabolism, glutamate is incorporated into the Krebs cycle and can build up as well as be released. Uh, I'm sure many of you know more about this than I do, but we know that it's bad, too much of it. Um, finally, if you think back to our uh, phospholipid bilayer, you have these glycerol pegs. And so kind of down the line, when you're actually seeing real cell breakdown, you're going to have increased glycerol levels. And that's a bad sign. All right, so microdialysis, how do we use this? Should we use this? 
Obviously not every neuro ICU is going to be equipped to do this. It requires pretty intensive nursing care. Nurses will write down all of the levels every hour. And, you know, even at Penn, there was only a flow sheet. I hadn't seen it before then, um, but they had to actually physically write it down. They don't put it in Epic. And then you look at the clipboard and say, hmm, this is the trend. But trends can be helpful. And I'll show a case in a second. And then, sorry, this is just kind of a macro view of what's going on. You have the pump, which is perfusing into this little catheter. And then just like hemodialysis, you know, there's a semi-permeable membrane, which will balance out with the tissue around the brain. And then you get the dialysis in which we will measure the markers. All right, so this is a patient. Um, and, you know, this is a TBI patient you have who at 6 p.m. the nurse is like, hmm, you know, MAP is up. I am i don't think the patient's doing as well neurologically. You look at the cerebral microdialysis and you're like, wow, the lactate pyruvate ratio, which is the red at the very beginning, that's high. Brain oxygen is lower than it should be. That's less than 20. And then your ICP is starting to rise. So, you know, we're thinking about this patient. You may do some things overnight, but maybe someone was sleeping. Um, so you come in in the morning, you look at the numbers, and we're like, all right, let's try and increase the map, increase cerebral blood flow, try and get this patient um, back to where they should be. So now you can see after increasing map, brain oxygen level is rising. That's a good sign that suggests that there's not mitochondrial dysfunction because we're actually able to use oxygen, um, as well as we're going to have a decrease in our lactate pyruvate ratio. And so, you know, trying to prevent further secondary injury, some may have happened in this time period. However, this is something that even if their ICP was still kind of under 20, we were able to treat that alone. The brain was still not doing well, and we wouldn't have any idea um, without looking at these numbers. Again, to say this is cutting edge, but not standard of care, and it's not evidence proven. But it makes sense from a metabolic standpoint. And so, you know, if you're looking at the actual absolute numbers in this, we're raising the map over 120. And that's that's pretty high. However, it actually improved the brain. So this person is probably either hypermetabolic or they need a lot more cerebral blood flow than, you know, the average patient. Um, I'm just going to save this, but... Basically, the difference, you know, between ischemia and mitochondrial dysfunction is that pyruvate will actually build up in mitochondrial dysfunction because it can't get brought into the cell. And in ischemia, you have, um, and these are patients that are usually septic. That's the um, most of the time in which we see mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, so you can see a shift kind of in your numbers in a TBI patient from maybe they were ischemic, they were doing fine, and then all of a sudden you're also getting an increased pyruvate. So that LPR, the lactate pyruvate ratio, won't be as increased. And it's, I don't know how to treat this. It's a bad sign, basically, but it is different from ischemia. All right. So, you know, using this in practice, for different patients, if it's just an elevated ICP, you're going to see these kind of numbers on your um, multimodality monitoring figures. And so treating ICP reduction, easy enough. Hypotension, a low MAP, seen with low blood ox or brain oxygen levels, as well as an increased lactate pyruvate ratio. Try and augment VP. And then for the patients in which you have your thinking that they have impaired autoregulation. You're going to have also, if you're using that pulse tile, um, reactivity index that will be elevated, and you'll get senses that they have, they're switching to anaerobic metabolism. And so we're going to try and optimize their O2 set as well, make sure that their glucose is normal to high. And for time's sake, I'm going to skip a couple of these scenarios. Um, the only thing I want to point out here, this is an interesting case in which I know there's a lot of jumbled, um, some artifact on here, so it's hard to follow, but the ICP is kind of maintained under 20 the whole time for this patient. CPP, cerebral perfusion pressure, is okay, but this is a really good example in which this patient is not actually getting enough cerebral blood flow. So that CPP surrogate is not reflecting the reality in the brain. And so 
you can see here the brain tissue oxygen is going down over this time period and the lactate pyruvate ratio is going up. So what's happening? Probably they're having some incidence of microvascular thrombosis because, you know, they're getting enough perfusion. Their sat is fine. They should have enough oxygen within the tissue. However, the brain cells themselves are not doing well. All right. And so, you know, that's just kind of an overview of how you can use cerebral microdialysis as well as the other monitoring modalities. Um, I think that it's a really interesting field. It's cool to look at the numbers. It doesn't always make that much of a clinical difference, but I think there's a lot of ways we can go from here. Um, and hopefully, you know, it will also offer us some of some insight into the actual pathophysiology of different TBI patients. And so I just wanted to mention briefly boost two and boost three. So the evidence for um, brain tissue oxygen monitoring comes from a few studies in which they showed that low brain tissue oxygen is a predictor of it, and they do pour. And they've also shown that you can increase PBTO2 with increasing oxygenation, which is a good and kind of thing. And so there was no real clinical trial until Boost 2 was published. Um, and so basically the primary objective, sorry, this is a busy slide, but just focus on the primary objective of Boost 2 was that you can use a treatment protocol and treat the PBTO2 that you see in your patient and reduce brain tissue hypoxia. So basically all they were trying to prove is that given the interventions that they used in the protocol, you can increase that number of brain tissue oxygen. They didn't have any comment on mortality or outcome. However, there was a significant trend um, towards decreased mortality in patients that we increased um, based on their PBTO2 monitoring their oxygen levels. Um, but they had to stop the trial early because the feasibility, which was the primary objective, was demonstrated. So now, I, at Penn, they were enrolled in Boost 3, and basically the goal is going to be whether by using the partial pressure of oxygen in the brain, we can result in improved neurologic outcome in this treatment. And so, you know, really funding, we have these FDA approved brain tissue oxygen monitors. Are they useful? What are we putting them in? Um, trying to provide some evidence for that. And then hopefully if that shows something, um, cerebral microdialysis evidence would be down the line. I think that's all I have time for, but I just want to say thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure to talk to you all today. Um, I was really grateful to be able to do, even if a non-operative year, a clinical year at Penn and kind of learn all of these things, bring some of them back to my home institution and happy to educate wherever I go. Thank you. Thank you, Aleka. I, I really truly believe that Critical care has always been and will continue to be one of the areas of neurosurgery that could have the most impact on patients if we continue to improve it. And that means you do research, that means you gather data. I'm intrigued. Now, obviously, your boost, et cetera, have strongly made arguments regarding tissue oxygenation. I'm intrigued by dialysis, mainly from work in animal treatment mm -hmm. models. That, um, this could be useful for metabolites, drug levels, uh, new compounds as opposed to the classic part of the lactate. Do you have any thoughts about that? What, what could be done as a research tool with dialysis? Yeah, that's very interesting to bring up. I mean, I think that if we can detect metabolites, especially as you said of drugs, right? And if we have some kind of medical therapy for glioblastoma or even one that we delivered surgically, seeing what the uptake is and what brain tissue is actually receiving that drug, I think is a really interesting application. Um, definitely could be a line of research. Um, and I'm sure there are others, you know, the cardiac field I feel like it's something we always compare to, whether it's stroke or other things, but they've found ways, they still do a lot of interventions, but all these medical treatments to treat their most prevalent diseases. And we have diseases that are very prevalent, but are so, so far in the early stages of medical treatment. And hopefully, 
you know, if we can make strides in that way, um, cerebral microdialysis could probably help in the actual proving um, during some of those trials. Yeah, and the smartest person in nurse surgery I ever knew, which was at Ofield, always felt that it could be both a monitor and a therapy, mm -hmm. an avenue of therapy directly delivered beyond the blood brain barrier. Other questions? I Thank think you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alana.